Thank you so much for joining us tonight for the webinar, Promoting Communication and Social Engagement in Young Children with Autism. Uh, Louise Southern, who is our Associate Clinical Director, will be your presenter tonight. And I believe that she is ready to get started. Louise, are you there? I am here. Thank you so much and welcome everyone. I'm excited to be here with you all tonight and also wanted to welcome Kim Tazard, who's the Director of Family Support. She's also um, participating as a panelist and I'll be here at the end um, to provide additional information on all of the amazing resources that our organization offers. And also, of course, she wears the hat as a parent of an individual with autism. So I'm really glad that she is here with me tonight. Um, so really quick, who am I, you know, uh, this person behind the, the screen? I'm Louise Southern again, and um, I have been working in, in the field of autism intervention since 1997. I started out with very young uh, toddlers with autism. Um, it was a great opportunity because I was um, fortunate enough to be kind of thrown right into being supervised by psychologists who were working in naturalistic play-based programs that were ABA programs, but they were play-based and naturalistic for young children with autism. And so I was super lucky just right out of the gate to get some great mentorship on the concept of play and engaging children with autism and using, you know, just my own love of, of children, but also the love of play to, to learn how to support young children. So, um, and I've worked in a variety of roles. I was a public school teacher um, in special education and worked in clinical settings and early intervention settings across the lifespan as well. And um, I also do for the Autism Society, a lot of trainings for those of you who are professionals. Uh, I also do a lot of trainings as does our clinical department for school systems across the state. Um, so we're, I'm excited to be here with you guys tonight. I'm also the parent of three boys. They do not have autism, but let's get going. Um, Tonight, I just want to briefly touch on the core features of autism and the way that those might present in young children. Most of you all are very familiar with autism, and of course, some of you are experts in autism, whether you're parents or professionals. So, but my review on that will be brief. And the reason I'm going to provide that review is in order to then be able to point back to the way that those that the strategies I'm going to present are responsive to these core features of autism. And then, of course, I'm going to outline some practical strategies that we can provide um, or apply to support um, children in, promote, in promoting social engagement and communication um, in young children with autism. So here's our visual schedule for tonight. Um, I'm sure many of you all have heard of visual schedules before and seen visual schedules, and this is a very basic first, next, then visual support intended to define for you as the audience what's going to happen and in what order. Um, and I just wanted to present this to you all just as a reminder, of course, that when we're thinking about supporting children with autism um, or adults with autism in some cases, for sure, we need to consider prevent presenting this kind of information in a concrete visual form to clarify what's going to happen and in what order and to give you a sense of power and control over the situation so you know what's going to happen next. So I'm going to give this brief webinar. I'm hoping then next after that, you all are going to pose questions um, using the comment and chat feature. Um, I encourage you to ask questions all along the way, and David will work and compile those and consolidate them. Um, he might throw a question at me during. If it's relevant to what I'm saying right then, that's fine too. So please pose your questions as we go. And then uh, finally, we'll be all done. And by 8 o'clock, you will go on to your next activity. So there's your schedule. So let's review the basic differences we see in many young children with autism. And of course, you all know that autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder. So that's a disorder that impacts brain development, likely at a very early point in development. Um, and what we see in individuals with autism are that they are often affected in two major areas, the areas of social communication and the area of behavior and sensory regulation. Those are kind of the two big buckets where we see differences in social communication and behavior and sensory regulation. And so we'll just take a quick moment to unpack that a little bit. So what do we know about those early indicators of autism and kind of early signs um, and what's fundamental to communication is something called joint attention. And, and research shows pretty clearly that many people, not all, but many people with autism tend to have difficulty with joint attention. And joint attention is the ability to share a focus on an experience with another person. It's really when, or, and when I say experience, I mean a situation, an object, an activity, and you're in that moment together attending to the same thing 
for the same reason and you both know that you are. And so it's examples of joint attention skills, for example, are when perhaps you follow someone's gaze and you look to see where they are looking or you follow their pointed finger to look at what they're pointing at. And then after you look at what they're pointing at, then you look back at them again to kind of create, uh, close out that triangle of communication. Other examples of joint attention, particularly that we might see in young children um, who we might consider typically developing or those with some with autism as well, but let's say I'm winding up a jack in the box um, and I'm winding it up with a young child and it's about to pop open and I'm winding it up and the, and the, the child's eyes are directed on the jack in the box and every now and then the child's eyes go up to look at me to look for my emotional signs. What am I looking at? What am I thinking? What am I feeling? And then the child's eyes go back down to the jack in the box when that jack in the box pops open. And then right after the child looks at the popped open jack in the box, their eyes typically will shift right over to that caregiver again to see what is that caregiver thinking and feeling. And those are those early, early opportunities where a child learns a lot of so key social and emotional information. That's kind of at the very core of communication, early communication. And it's also at the core of like perspective taking and social skill development. Another example of joint attention might be, uh, let's say, um, and actually this happened, I was in an airport with a friend a few years ago and there happened to be um, a, a very attractive movie star. Um, I won't say who he was, but anywho, uh, walking down the, the, the corridor and I was like, like mouth open, looking at him and then looked back at my friend. She looked at what I was looking at and then we both looked at each other like, oh my gosh, there's an example of joint attention again. So there's lots of these examples I could give to you, but it's a really a critical skill. It's important to communication and language learning, to social communication and social thinking skills. And it has implications in really all areas of, of life, activities of daily living, employment, classroom performance. Um, and so for a child with autism, what some researchers are noticing and what we're anecdotally seeing is that for instance, with that Jack in the Box example, what might happen for some children with autism is that their eyes never shift away from the object. Maybe their eyes don't shift to the caregiver to see what the caregiver is thinking and feeling in that moment. And so there's that lack or limited joint attention in that moment. So that can be an example of, of what we might see in some with autism. We also know that in autism, um, some children have difficulty integrating or putting together and coordinating nonverbal behaviors um, with their verbal communication, um, or they have a difficulty with eye gaze, for example, or looking or using gestures to communicate and to kind of keep the social interaction going. So pointing to what they want and then referencing their caregiver as if to say, hey, do you see what I'm pointing at that I want? So that's an example where we might see some children with autism who struggle to do that. Um, we might see difficulty with some children with autism in requesting further social interactions, kind of keeping the interaction going. Um, and we might see in some that they struggle to read social cues, for example, to read those faces, to read perspectives, and then to change their behavior according to what they see and know about the other person's thoughts or feelings based on what that, that other person is showing. So then we also see some, some differences in kind of the sharing of affect. So for example, let's say, you know, you're looking, the child is looking at the train going around the tracks and his eyes stay on the train um, and, and you're making all kinds of efforts to try to draw his attention over to you. And, and maybe he's not shifting his gaze over to you and you're not really sharing in that experience of watching the train together. So there may be some difficulty with just kind of sharing in the moment together sort of the, the back and forth and reciprocity um, might be limited or lacking in some individuals with autism. And in some, we see difficulty with just initiating social interaction or the initiations might look different or a little bit unusual. Um, or some may struggle to respond to our efforts to socially engage. Um, so that, these are some of the examples of what we might see in children with autism. These differences in this core area of social communication which also kind of lends us, leads us over into discussion around differences in behavior regulation, but also still the social realm where we can see differences in their flexibility or creativity in play. And so this is kind of a classic example that you see here on the left of toys lined up. This might be what some children with autism do, kind of creating predictability and structure and order 
um, because maybe that's what they're more familiar with. It's more understandable to them and more meaningful. Whereas in other children, we might see them using those toy figurines in very dynamic, creative, imaginative, pretend ways, using them flexibly and differently each time. We know that some children with autism would, would struggle to do that, would struggle to understand the themes that we're trying to, to use in play, or they may struggle to, to, to be flexible around the fact that like, for example, this particular character can in this case be a bad guy, but in the next example, we might have him be the doctor. And so changing roles and being flexible in that way in the context of play is something that we often see some individuals with autism struggle with. And then, you know, further, we see some differences in sort of these restricted patterns of interest. So for some children with autism, they may have a kind of a limited variety of play activities that they engage in, or a limited variety of toys that they are gravitate towards, um, or limited topics or themes or areas of focus um, that they kind of really gravitate to and struggle to sort of take on and, and add more variety, like we might expect to, to see children do. For some children with autism, we would see them displaying extensive knowledge around a particular topic. So I worked with a young child who struggled with flexible play, but knew everything there was to know about NASCAR and race cars. But he really struggled, for example, to you know, use car play in flexible and pretend or thematic kind of ways. Um, and in some cases, as we all know, their, their, their interest or, or a particular area of knowledge may not be a common area. So Maybe for one, one example is a child who's highly knowledgeable about the make and model of ceiling fans. And so sometimes these interests can be very um, unique and idiosyncratic uh, or different. Um, and in some we see where there's a need for things to look or be a certain way or may become accept, uh, upset over minor changes. And so you can imagine, I think most of you know this of course, then that we can see these, these tendencies in the context of play and social interaction where this, these sort of tendencies come out, it can be very difficult to know how to engage or how to build on engagement, how to um, expand the variety of play that the child is engaging in. So these are some of these core characteristics about autism though that we need to keep in mind and they inform how we're gonna respond with some of the strategies we use. Just really quick, um, I'm, I'm sure most of you all know this, but for example, if those of you all who are professionals in the audience, um, you know, it's of course important to know what are those early signs, uh, red flags that there may be a, a problem with development. And these, these, these indicators you see here aren't necessarily wholly suggestive just of autism, but they do indicate that there may be some problem with development that requires further exploration with a medical provider um, to explore it further. Uh, we always encourage caregivers and parents, and I know Kim would say this as well, if you're concerned about your child, then, you know, advocate for that and speak out and seek, you know, seek additional um, evaluation or screening and support. But some of these early signs we might see is those the, sort of the limited back and forth in the social situations, the lack of smiles and engagement and kind of the, re the responding um, to our efforts to socially engage even very, very young infants. Um, if we don't see babbling by 12 months, or maybe we're not seeing those back and forth gestures such as pointing, reaching, showing, waving um, by 12 months. If we see um, limited responding to name by about 12 or 16 months, we certainly, um, that could be uh, another indicator. If we see limited language development at those 16 month mark, and then at the, at the 24 month mark, you know, limited, you know, no two word phrases being put together. Um, and of course, any regression or loss of social or communication skills is always a reason to be concerned. There are some great video libraries out there, uh, for one produced by, by Autism Speaks, another one, uh, the CDC website's Learn the Signs and Act Early, has um, a lot of information um, about this, but just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page about what, what are some of the indicators we need to be looking for. And you can see so many of these responses that we expect to see in young children, they really center around social communication. And that's why a lot of my strategies tonight are gonna to be rooted in how do we promote social engagement and communication in young children with autism. And the objectives tonight are really to talk about how do we promote this in the context of play and, wh and why play. Um, you know, we know that best practices in early autism intervention recognize that social motivation uh, which may be an area of difference or deficit in some children with autism, 
it needs to be addressed through these joint activity routines that build reciprocity and sustain engagement with another person. And when I say joint activity routines, these might, these might also be referred to as like shared control or turn taking, balance turns or reciprocal interactions that are, that are prolonged and can get longer and longer and, and can expand in their complexity. And so the goal of early intervention in autism is to increase that social reciprocity, the social back and forth and turn taking. And it's, it's an effort to maintain and to carefully expand those interactions. Um, so many of the strategies I'm gonna reference, I just want you all to know this, draw uh, directly from a broad group of evidence-based practices that are categorized as naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions. NDBIs. And so I wanted to make, make it clear that that's really the body of, of, of research um, that I'm drawing from. And so these strategies, these, these naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions, draw from two primary fields. They draw from the fields of behavioral science or applied behavior analysis, ABA, and they also draw heavily, heavily from developmental science, what we know about child development and how children develop play and language and cognition and so on. So um, just want you to know that the philosophy here is that we're really marrying these two area, these two broad buckets of science, of developmental science and applied behavior analysis as I talk about these strategies. And so what are some of the early intervention goals that we can target in, in the context of play? And I'm gonna talk about what I mean by play and that when I say play, I wanna make it clear that play looks different for, for different children with autism. Play is not always gonna be at the same starting point for every child with autism because there, is, there really is are, are different starting points along a long trajectory when we're thinking about play skills. But some of the early intervention goals that we can target in play are teaching, for example, verbal and nonverbal communication forms that can serve a variety of functions. So things like requesting with intention. And I don't necessarily just mean requesting verbally. I'm talking about requesting with gestures, requesting with looking, requesting with smiles, requesting by giving an object to get assistance with opening it, for example. But requesting in whatever form that comes is a critical communication skill that we target heavily in the context of early intervention play based uh, preschool programming or home-based caregiver mediated programming. Um, another communication response that we want to focus on is rejecting or terminating, a child being able to say, no, I don't want that. And again, they might say it verbally or they might say it in another way, but teaching and building upon those skills of self-advocacy so that a child has ways to say what they want and what they don't want in whatever form they're able to, to communicate that. And then other, other communication forms that we wanna make sure we're addressing or, or, or functions that we wanna address are sharing interests, for example, showing. So we're trying to teach the child with autism, for example, to show as they're engaging in play, hey, look at what I'm doing. Look at what my race car just did. Do you see what just happened? We wanna build on those early skills as well, those bids, what we would call bids for joint attention. So I'm gonna talk about how, how do you do that? Again, some more early intervention goals that we target in play though, are res also responding, supporting the child and responding to the cues of others. So responding to my point, responding to my eye gaze. So we want a child to reference our faces and eye gaze, for example, not because we're trying to get them to make eye contact, but it's about getting social information. That's, that's really what I'm talking about here following our point to see what it is we're pointing to that we want their eye to go to. Um, we also target uh, imitation skills, but naturalistically and associated play action. So for example, if I make the car crash into the wall, an associated action that we might be targeting is that the child then crashes a boat you know, down the hill and into the, the water, for example. Um, so those are those kinds of play-based responses that we're targeting. And then, of course, following simple instructions, but in a naturalistic play-based and routine-based context. These are some of the key early intervention goal areas that we tend to focus on in young children with autism. And I would encourage you to really look at what you're working on with your child with autism if they're quite young, or for you, those of you all who are professionals and, and examine, you know, are these the kinds of areas that you're targeting? And then what it's all about is how you target this. That's really what I'm going to talk about tonight.
And so the how comes in, you know, when, we, when I'm, I'm going to emphasize that motivation is so critical as a starting point. When we're trying to promote social engagement and communication in young children with autism, we've got to start with kind of these core questions. So ask yourself this, you know, what does he or she like to do? What are all the things or activities or objects or items or places or people? What does he or she gravitate towards? What is it that he or in, in this in a particular moment? What is it that he or she wants? What are some of the things that if you wish he would ask for, but he or she maybe doesn't right now or isn't using for kind of comprehensive communication skills to make his or her requests known? Then, so how can I engage him around his or her preferences? And so this is really where I'm saying, we're gonna start with what's interesting and motivating to the child, rather than starting with what we might think are the right you know, conventional toys or activities to start with. We've got to start with what their interests are and what are they gravitating to, to try to begin to get engagement, to get social engagement with, with a young child with autism. And then the question is, you know, at, at, when you're in those situations, how can I become a means for him or, or her to get what they want in that moment? And so I'm going to walk you through what this looks like. But these are some of the core questions. This is just like a basic formula. When you're trying to begin to get engagement, you're trying to promote communication, and you've got to start with what's motivating to that child, though. That's got to be the starting point when we're trying to build social motivation and when we're trying to build social communication. So, so what are some of the, the communication behaviors that, that I'm going to be targeting if I'm working with a young child with autism through naturalistic play-based strategies? I'm going to target responses like looking. I'm going to target the approach like, will, can I get the child to walk over to me and engage and join? That's a, a key skill that we want to see in many children with autism that maybe we're not seeing sometimes. We also want to target responses like reaching pointing, using a, you know, a real point um, to indicate what they want or to indicate, hey, look over there or look at this. And giving to get, what I mean by that is you know, the child handing you the object in order for you to fix it or in order for you to open it order, or in order for you to activate it or get it going again. And then showing, showing is another response that we're targeting, a communication response. So again, that's where the child shows you the Play-Doh that he's just created, the Play-Doh structure that he's just made, as if to say, hey, look what I made, isn't that cool? These are these responses that we see very early on in typically developing children, and they are fundamental communication building blocks. Sometimes what I see is an early intervention program for a child with autism that is, is very quickly focused on vocal communication. And I don't get me wrong, I understand that uh, we want, our, you know, if, if, if we can, obviously an aim is for the individual to use vocal language to communicate, but sometimes we're not placing enough emphasis on these core non-vocal communication responses. Because if you think about how you interact with other people, when you're vocally communicating with them, think about how important these non-vocal communication behaviors are. They moderate the quality of your vocal communication. They, they communicate so much. They communicate like 80% of what we're actually saying. So it's really important that we put a lot of emphasis on these core communication behaviors in early intervention. How do we, you know, these are some of the really somewhat obvious ways that we can arrange opportunities for communication. Um, for example, um, you can place the, the highly desirable items up high. You're setting up a way, a reason for the child to need to interact or communicate with you. You're becoming a means to get what they want if you arrange the environment in that way, for example. Or you're putting items in containers so that they need you to help them to access those items. And so, and you're also maybe contriving help situations. So let's say you've got the juice box and the straw, and maybe usually you're inclined to just put that straw right in the juice box for them. But maybe this is an opportunity instead to target communication, where then they need to hand you the straw as if to say, I need help with this. I can't do this yet. And if you can, you know, contrive those situations and set those up repeatedly, that child over time is much more likely to independently initiate handing you the straw to communicate. And eventually, maybe they're then vocally or otherwise communicating, hey, I need help. So we have to, we have to um, follow natural opportunities for communication. We also have to arrange some of these opportunities for communication to happen. 
rather than just kind of doing it for them or anticipating or overly anticipating the child's needs. We want to try to set up these situations where they need to communicate with us and then creating repeated practice opportunities naturalistically so for this to happen as much as we can set it up. Other ways we can do this, you know, inserting those pauses, those excited expectant looks like, oh, what's going to happen next to see, will they look towards you? And there's, that's a communication event right there. If they even look in your direction in that moment, that might be the first form of communication that we need to target in some of our children with autism. And then obviously, if we're targeting communication in whatever form, whether that's vocal or sign language or picture exchange or pointing or looking or reaching, whatever form of communication we're targeting for that particular child, pausing in those moments where there's motivation, prompting or helping them if needed to make the communication request, and then of course, immediately honoring the request so that they can start to make the connection between this communication behavior gets me what I want. So here's, I, so here's one video I wanna show you guys. I'm very sad because um, the audio on these videos is not gonna transmit to you guys through GoToMeeting tonight, um, but that's okay because everything you need is, is you can get through watching this video and I'm gonna narrate over it because I'm not, there's nothing, we can, this, me and this child don't actually say hardly anything in this video. I want you to pay attention to the non verbal communication behavior that I am targeting in this video naturalistically by using what's interesting and motivating to this child and how can I use that routine to build engagement, to get at kind of communication skills, but also just to, to start to help him understand that a social interaction like this is fun and rewarding and can lead to more opportunities. So here we go. So in this little cutie, what I'm looking for is, is that eye gaze. That's the communication request that I'm looking for from him. And that's all I need, you know, for him. That's basically him saying to me, I want you to keep doing that. I like what you're doing. And I'm reading his signs, those affective indicators that he's having fun. And I'm following those cues carefully because I'm going to know based on his cues, when is it time to stop spinning him and go and shift to a different activity? So I'm sensitive to his motivation, I'm following those signs, and I'm targeting communication in this basic sensory social routine. So here's another quick example. This is of another young child, um, and I want you to watch here. You know, this is an even younger learner, um, but I'm, I'm just got a base, I've got a, a bottle of bubbles here, and I'm targeting some basic non-vocal communication responses. And you're gonna, you won't be able to hear me, but I'm modeling the words bubbles bubbles and I'm, I'm using language and I'm modeling, but I'm not targeting language in him. So watch, watch what I'm working for here. I do wish you could hear that, guys, but what I was targeting there, and you know, there's just some good laughing going on, lots of that affective interaction, is just his looking towards me, him following the bubble, and then him coming back to me and looking to me again. So I'm, I'm targeting the approach. Remember, I talked about the approach earlier. I wanted him to, I pulled out those bubbles, and I want him to come running over. And I, so that's one thing of one of the things I'm, one of the communication responses or social responses I'm targeting, and I'm targeting that eye gaze. And then as I'm saying bubbles, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't hear what he was doing, but he's kind of, you know, making a, some kind of vocalization and he's moving his body a little bit in his head to be like, yes, do it again, blow bubbles again. And so that, those are these rich communication opportunities where he's highly motivated. It's a social situation and we're building social engagement. And this is our starting point with some of our children with autism, where we really have to start with what's motivating to them, starting there, 
and taking it one baby step at a time and building, building, building. So again, you know, thinking about what's motivating to your, your particular child, start there. Um, and then what, what we're going to talk about is arranging sensory-based or object-based play routines that we can enjoy together. And the whole idea is if a child gravitates towards primarily sensory activities um, or solo object-based activities, the question we need to ask ourselves is what can we do? How can we gradually insert ourselves into this routine to make this routine more fun with us than without us over time? So in these two examples, you could see here, you know, with bubbles, you know, he could play with bubbles to some extent on his own. Obviously, he's not ready to blow bubbles by himself. But so I'm making bubbles more fun because there's another person involved from his perspective. Or in the example where I'm spinning that child, he can spin on his own, if he, I guess, if he wanted to, right? But the idea is that spinning can be more fun in this context, and it becomes a social activity. It, develop, it has some social qualities to it. And so these are examples of what I've just shown you in those videos are, sense, are examples of sensory social routines. And really what they are comprised of is we're often starting with what might be a primarily a sensory area of focus where a child gravitates towards whether it's kind of kinesthetic, lots of gross motor movement activities, or whether it's sort of tactile based, um, cause and effect, you know, auditory, like lights, sounds, you know, whatever sort of sensory modalities that child is real into, whatever they tend to gravitate towards, using those materials, those activities, and then trying to build a social component into them. So what are some examples of that? There's, ba there's basic examples, of course, things like tickles and songs with finger play. So singing the itsy bitsy spider and moving our fingers along, making silly noises, games that involve chase and tickles, spinning on a swing, water play in the sink, bubbles, pushing a child on the swing, pulling a child around on a blanket, um, balloon, blowing it up and releasing it into the air, um, and listening to that funny sound it makes as it winds down together, bouncing, jumping. These are just a few examples of sort of the starting points for, for basic sensory social routines, where in these routines, we can start to target naturalistically communication responses that we wanna see in that young child with autism. And for some children with autism, of course, we might need to start with um, very narrow or different areas of interest. So I was working with a young child in a preschool setting and, and um, out on the playground, he wanted nothing to do with slides and swings and monkey bars. That was not his thing, but what he loved was mulch. Um, and so he, he, he would sit right down and play in the mulch and play in the sand and play in the dirt. And so I had to start with what was interesting and motivating to him. It was not gonna work for me to try to take him over to the slide or the swings um, because that's not where his motivation was. And so in order for me to start to build some social rapport and social engagement with him and to start to target some of those communication skills, I had to start with what was motivating for him. So we were lifting mulch and dropping it down and I was seeing if he was interested in that and he would watch as I dropped the mulch kind of dramatically from my hands and sprinkled it down onto the ground and sprinkled it onto my own leg, sprinkled it onto his legs, and he liked that. And I could tell that he did. And so that was the starting point for a basic routine of engagement with that child. So my point here is just sometimes we gotta start with, you know, maybe very unusual areas of interest to build a social relationship and to start to target communication. Here's another really, I love this video. Again, you don't actually have to hear um, this to understand what's happening, though I, I hate that you're missing the laughs and giggles, um, but this is a young child with autism and I just want you to pay attention to what are, the, what are the communication responses that we're targeting in this sensory social routine? And to hide, where is she? So she's targeting there. Obviously, we're targeting that look, the laughs, the happy factor. That's critical in early intervention, right? Um, and we're also, though, targeting that approach where he's seeking her out, finding her, looking for her. Those are very early communication responses that we wanna see 
that start to build and prolong social interactions between people. So that's the starting point with that little guy. Um, and just starting with what he loves, kind of the hiding, the pursuit, the tickles, the bouncing, the big gross motor kind of activities. That's really the starting point for him. And so I would say, you know, to all of you, it is all about finding the right starting point. With each child with autism, that is going to be different. Um, you know, as you could see in those videos um, with that, that little fellow, for example, he's not ready for, let's say, pretend or imaginative play that involves like little characters or cars or trucks or building elaborate schemes like let's pretend that we're going to the doctor and the puppy dog is sick. He's not ready for those thematic kind of pretend or dramatic play activities. Where he's ready for is those sensory social routines primarily. And so that's our starting point with him. Whereas with another learner who maybe has a wider range of play skills, uh, for example, I was working with a young child who, who has a lot of different play interests, but he's real rigid around how the other people play with those, those items um, and has a lot of issues around that. And so he's really into Thomas the Train. And so for him, I'm not gonna go in and try to violate all of his routines or anything like that, but I'm gonna start with what is he interested in and then very playfully try to build in new parts, new activities, new actions, new themes into what's interesting with him. But so we have to know each, that each child with autism is, is at a different point in sort of the developmental trajectory of play and where, where is the right starting point? It's gonna be really important for us to think about when we're trying to get engagement. But wherever that child is, I would say, you know, we, we wanna start small. And so when we enter the child's preferred activities, Sometimes we have to just work on them, you know, tolerating us kind of being in their presence. And that's not certainly not true for all children, uh, but for some that can be, you know, uh, something that we have to address. And so if that's an issue, the last thing we want to do is walk into that context and start placing demands on that child. Rather, we just want to be near them in their proximity and follow their lead. So, you know, if, if they're sifting blocks, um, on the, they're laying out on the ground and they're just kind of sifting them over and over, for example, we're gonna follow their lead. We might narrate, oh, you're moving the blocks. I see you moving the blocks. We might imitate what they're doing, even if it might not be a conventional way to use those blocks, capture, trying to capture their attention by imitating what it is that they are doing can often be a really appropriate way to try to, to get engagement, to get a brief sort of beginning of their attention directed to us when we're trying to build a social interaction. Um, and then of course, again, like I said, don't place demands initially. So, you know, if I walk over that child, I'm not gonna be like, oh, let's build a tower with those blocks because that might not be a concept or an activity that he's motivated to do. So I have to start with where he's at and build from there. And then as we begin, begin to play, you know, we wanna make sure we're not making drastic changes, but just kind of systematically finding those ways to build ourselves into the routines. And I'm gonna give you some examples of that in just a moment. And then in some cases, maybe we gradually take control over some items, not everything. I don't mean take control of all of it. I just mean take over some of the items so that that child has a reason to make some requests of us to get those items, for example. And so when we're establishing these play routines, these sort of back and forth shared control, sort of turn taking or balance turn opportunities, we're, we're always looking for the shared affect and engagement. We wanna find the smile, that's, that's critical. Um, you know, this should not be unpleasant for the child. Um, if, you know, we wanna start with what's motivating to them. Um, and then slowly working towards the back and forth and then playfully modifying the routine to expand upon it. And then monitoring their reaction to make sure that the activity is still really enjoyable to them. That's so critical along the way. So a question I'm gonna ask myself as we you know we're, I'm starting to build up an activity, a play activity or an interaction with that child is um, after a few times, you know, what can I do, to, what can I add to the mix? How can I change it up just a little bit, not a ton, but how can I change it up a little bit to work so, towards some variety? So in, the, so in the example of the child who's on the floor in the preschool setting and he's just inclined to sift through those blocks and kind of move them around in a pretty disorganized way, and he's just maybe sifting, maybe it's a sensory-based sort of need that he has to move those. Again, I'm not gonna come over and stop him necessarily from doing that at all. I'm gonna walk over, I'm gonna engage by imitating what he's doing. I'm gonna try to capture even a brief moment of his attention. 
hey, look at what I'm doing. I'm doing it too. I'm going to narrate what he's doing. Look at the blocks. I see what you're doing with the blocks. You're moving the blocks. And then eventually what I might try to do is change it up just a little bit. So then maybe I'm going to get a little bucket and I'm going to pick up a few of those blocks and drop them down one at a time into the bucket. Maybe I'm going to sing a little song as I do it. Maybe I'm going to start to block to, to stack up those blocks, but then I'm going to playfully knock them down. So what can I do to try to capture his attention? And sometimes it's a fleeting glance that we're looking for initially with some children with autism to try to begin to get social engagement with them. It really depends on the child. So here's an example of shaking it up or kind of changing it up to get a little bit of variety. So this is a child, um, he's, he, he likes playing with cars, he likes sliding them down the ramp. And so what I want you to notice that this um, person does is she just crashes that her car into his. Um, and so she kind of violates the routine just a little bit, um, but she's looking for the signs that he likes that she did that. And you'll see if you, you've got to pay careful attention to his face, but um, he's laughing and smiling as she does that. So she's real sensitive to his cues of motivation. And then he takes it. He, he wants a break from that. He wants to do it by himself. And she, fought, she honors that. She doesn't push that. And she's waiting him out. She's giving him a moment. But then look, he comes back to her and does it again. And he's smiling and laughing. And she's he's she's honoring those requests that he's making. The request is him uh, by him taking the object from her hand. Right now, that's where we're at with him. And all she's looking for is the smiles and the laughs and those signs of that he wants her to continue. So she's not pushing for any kind of vocal request. She's not pushing for any of that right now. She's just trying to build a routine of engagement and get some social interaction, um, a social quality to this activity. So this is the starting point with a little guy like him. And so when we're thinking about some young children with autism, one, a key strategy that I've found helpful for some is to pair new toys, new materials, new actions, or new themes with their previously established preferred activities. So what do they love to do? What do they love to play with? What do they love to engage with? And then what you try to do is you add a new toy, a new material, a new theme to that existing activity in order to give that new toy or new materials or new actions or new themes reinforcing value. So that over time, you're trying to expand what this child loves to do and how they like to play. So here are some, some um, examples of that. So for example, if you've got a child with autism who loves string, loves to manipulate it, loves to swirl it, loves to twirl it, loves to you know, hold it in their hands, um, then maybe you try, you get some string too, and you swirl some string in washable paint on a piece of paper to see what that string does to that paint and the patterns that it makes on that paper. And so what you're trying to do is to draw that child's interest over into a painting activity, which maybe they're not so into conventionally, like with a paintbrush and everything, but you're using what they do like, which is this, which are strings, and you're bringing that into the paint routine to try to make painting more interesting and motivating to that child. Another example, like, so let's say the child loves being chased by, by adults. Um, so then in this case, and I've, I've had this, um, definitely use this strategy with a particular guy I'm thinking about, where we started to use some stuffed animals to, to quote unquote, chase the child with me. And then over time, those stuffed animals acquired a lot of like value to that child. They became reinforcing and motivating and the child wanted those animals to be involved in the play, whereas before the child did not. Another example, you know, the child loves rice, you know, playing in a rice table, kind of loves the sensory uh, modality, or maybe on the flip side, they love dinosaurs. And you're bringing those two worlds together and you're trying to pair dinosaurs with the rice table, or you're trying to pair the rice table with dinosaurs, which is something he already loves. And you're trying to just expand his interests, his play activity. You know, let's say he loves water beads, you know, playing kind of with those, those water manipulative, those beads that are squishy. 
So then maybe you take that over into kitchen play where we're dumping those into the pot and we're stirring them and we're mashing them. So we're starting to build in the thematic area of kitchen play into something that he or she already likes, which is water beads. So the list goes on here. Cars, you know, let's say, you know, he likes to use Play-Doh. So then you're creating rows with Play-Doh and you're driving the cars onto the Play-Doh. And so you're trying to pair cars with Play-Doh, which he already loves. You're just trying to expand his horizon, so to speak, in, in the world of play. And so there's, there's so many different ways to do that, depending on the individual. Or think about that child I was talking about earlier who loves Thomas the Train and plays with Thomas the Train in only certain ways. So I tried to bring in the thematic idea of, oh my gosh, Thomas is sick. He needs to go to the doctor. And so I used a lot of creative like, you know, energy. And I was like, Thomas is really sick and he's driving along the train track to the hospital. He turned Thomas over, the doctor fixes Thomas. And by doing that, the child began to, to understand and enjoy the theme of quote unquote doctor play by, because I used Thomas as the starting point for that. So think about whether there are ways where you can pair new toys, new materials, new themes with some of these preferred activities that the child already has. That's a way to expand. And so what, you know, what makes a good play partner? And I realize I'm talking to families, I'm talking to professionals tonight as well. Um, but regardless of your role, of course, you know, being enthusiastic, being playful, not being self-conscious about it, if you can help that, um, and being willing to be silly and thinking outside the box. I can't tell you how many times I've had success, not when I try to do play in a conventional way with a, with a child where I'm like, let's feed the baby the bottle. That doesn't often work as a starting point. But when I use the baby in an unconventional way and baby is bouncing on the trampoline and then baby makes a big flip and lands and we sing a silly song about it or the baby pretends to cry, for example, that's a way to maybe get some engagement and enjoyment and a way to target communication with that young child with autism. So I would just say, you know, being creative, thinking outside the box and being really careful to pay attention to those early signs of motivation and responding to those across a play activity. And again, you know, motivation is really a teachable moment. When we see a child who is motivated for something, that's our opportunity for, in some cases, for example, to target communication. So for example, when the child wants an item or an object, um, wait for that behavioral request. And what I mean by behavioral request is the look or the reach or the point or the give or the act to sustain. So maybe the child waves his or her hands as if to say, tickle me again, or the verbalization or whatever form of communication that child is using that you are targeting. And then of course you immediately honor that request. And then also it's, it's a really good strategy to target what, what I would call continuation requests, where you pause the activity midway through. Once you can see that kid is having fun, you pause it briefly. You wait for the behavioral request or the vocal request or whatever form of requesting you're targeting, and then you quickly honor that request by keeping going. So you're showing this child that through their use of communication in whatever form it comes, this is the way to get what you want. And we're building this, this, this dyad of, of interaction and communication, a back and forth that we can build on through dynamic and creative ways of addressing play with a young child with autism. And so again, I say, you know, the fundamental communication targets, and I already had a slide on this earlier, but just wanted to say it again, that even if our goals are to, to target vocal communication with a young child with autism, or if our goals are to target sign language or using a picture exchange communication system, or whatever forms of communication we're targeting, I would just encourage us to not lose sight of some of these early and most fundamental building blocks of communication that again, really do have a, a, they really mediate the quality of vocal communication. Um, so much of what we say is not what we, what comes out of our mouth, but our nonverbal communication cues that we use when, when we're acting, interacting with anyone. So keep these, these targets in mind. And then, so how do we promote nonvocal communication? Again, you know, when motivation is present, when you can see that the child wants something to happen, wants an item, wants an action to occur, wants you to do something, um, or wants you to stop doing something maybe, um, or wants to end an activity, you know, model the gesture or movement in that moment. And if they're not responsive to the modeling that you provide, then maybe you give them, you help them use that gesture in that moment. So not a full hand over hand, 
And maybe you guide their hand a little bit in using that gesture or pointing to support them. And then they, they use that gesture. And then you, you practice that again and again in natural situations where motivation is present. And through repeated practice, through lots of opportunities of, of, with practice across the day, then over time, the idea is that that child will begin to use that gesture of pointing, for example, without our prompting. And they'll begin to initiate those sorts of gestural cues. It does require a lot of practice. And I don't mean trial after trial. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about trying to find those natural opportunities, but really building in a communication rich environment, whether we're at home with a child or whether we're in a preschool setting or wherever we are, where we are thinking about all the ways we can target communication and setting those situations up and following those signs of motivation to target those communication behaviors is so critical. Um, there are different guidelines on this, and you know, and I don't want you to get stuck on this particular number. But a lot of times, when I'm working with a child, a young child with autism, within an hour, I'm trying to target between 20 to 40. It really depends. 20 to 40 communication responses across that hour. And again, I don't necessarily mean vocal. I'm talking about the non-vocal uh, forms of communication as well. But that's when I say a communication rich environment, I mean really frequent opportunities for that child to make requests, to indicate with gestures, to approach, to use eye gaze, to reject activities by maybe pushing it away or handing. All of those are communication forms um, that we want to consider and that we want to target in our young children with autism. And then, of course, we want to incorporate gestures into play routines by modeling them ourselves as much as we possibly can taking turns pointing out preferred objects uh, or, or pictures, looking at books together and pointing and taking turns doing that if we can. And then certainly, you know, presenting visual choices using objects or pictures is a really nice structured way to target some of those nonverbal communication behaviors we wanna see like pointing. So what I mean by that is you've got two objects here, you've got peanuts and Oreos, for example, which one do you want? And we're targeting the response of that child pointing for example, to what it is that they want in that moment. There's motivation. We know the child wants a snack, so we're naturally targeting this opportunity for pointing in this situation. Or which book do you wanna read? Point to the, which, point to the one you want. So using these, these motivating situations and setting it up in really concrete visual form is often a critical way to support some of our learners with autism in understanding what the options are and a good way to target, for example, the point gesture that we want to see in our young children. And then again, you know, I've been talking a lot, I've been emphasizing heavily non-vocal communication forms just because I, I don't want those to get overlooked or lost in early intervention programs. Um, but when we're targeting vocal communication as well, of course, looking for those signs of motivation. What is that kid motivated for right now? And have I set up opportunities across the day, across the hour, if I can swing that, for that child to communicate? And so when I see that the child is motivated, for example, maybe they're looking, you know, I can see that they want more juice, they're looking at it, um, I can tell that they do, I can see those signs, I pause. And then if they're not gonna use that vocal language spontaneously yet, then I'm gonna model the language for them, juice. Um, or I'm going to model the sign if they're not using vocal language, or I'm going to model the picture touch or the picture exchange. And then as soon as that child uh, uses that form of communication after I've modeled it, I'm going to honor that attempt. And I'm going to pair it with lots of social praise. That's right, you said juice. Here you go, there's your juice. And of course, if they initiate communication on their own, obviously in early intervention, it's critical that we honor those forms as much as we can, as often as we can, and in some cases, give them more as if to say, wow, you just told me that spontaneously. That is so awesome. Here, you can have even more of this because you, you quote unquote, said it so well by yourself. So it really capturing those moments and honoring them quickly and targeting them frequently is, is really important when we're thinking about our young children with autism. And this, you know, in addition to vocal communication, if we're target, if there are other ways to augment communication. and so. You know, for example, if you're working in a preschool setting, we can use visual choice boards and they come in a lot of different forms. Um, I don't want you to think this is the only way to convey, you know, what the options are for a child who's working in a preschool setting. Here's another example. This is a, a, a sort of a communication board that a child might need to use to, to support them in communication around their wants and needs. 
And the idea with whatever modality of communication we're targeting, let's target it frequently. Let's target it naturalistically, and let's target it in the context of their motivation. That is real critical in early intervention that we think about it that way. Really across the board beyond early intervention as well, for sure. Um, here's another example. This is a, you know, a, a tablet device where we're supporting communication and they've got a choice between goldfish and crackers. Which one do you want? And maybe they're pointing to or pressing the one um, to indicate what they want. So, but again, targeting these opportunities frequently, whatever form of communication the child is using, it's just critical that we, uh, again, center it around, at least initially, what is motivating to them? What do they want to communicate about? That's what we need to be targeting first. It's sometimes I'll say, um, it can be a mistake, um, in my opinion, in just my professional opinion, to target communication responses that the child is not motivated to communicate. So before he or she can be asked to label, you know, shapes, letters, and colors, for example, I want to make sure he can tell me what he wants and doesn't want. That's that's fundamentally critical um, in early intervention. And yes, shapes and colors and letters and numbers, all of that is important. I'm not saying that it's not, but we've got to target communication in the context of motivation to start. And so often the way to do that is in play is in play that starts with what that child is into and building from there, those play-based interactions. Or if it's sign language, right? No matter what mode of communication we're targeting, let's make sure we're, we're initially addressing it in the context of what he's motivated to say and targeting it frequently and using play as a way to build in those communication opportunities. And so this is just sort of a mantra that you know we would have, like let's not ever commun compartmentalize communication or play. Um, I think generally the field has come a long way in this regards where it's no longer like we're gonna work on play uh, or a play-based program or a communication goal for 30 minutes, then we're gonna move on to something else. Play and communication should be embedded into all aspects of an early, a high quality early intervention program. Um, so it should not be compartmentalized to certain parts of the day. Um, yeah, obviously, we want this to be happening at a high rate, particularly communication at a high rate across the day. A communication-rich environment is what we're going for. So again, just kind of wrapping up, um, the keys to success here um, in this very quick webinar, um, uh, identifying the right starting point for this child, finding the motivation, you know, start with what they're into. Whatever that is, that's your starting point. And you can try to build from there. You can build and build more and more elaborate routines. You can expand the play routine. You can add materials, add new things to the mix. And you can also, like I said, pair new toys, new themes, new actions with previously established preferred activities to try to expand that play repertoire in that regard. And in all of that, working on communication is, is where it's at. The context for targeting communication is in those naturalistic, motivating, play-based routines and activities in so many cases. And of course, start with help, give prompts. You know, We wanna support individuals in communicating so that they don't encounter failure or errors. And then we're trying to fade out that support, fade out those prompts over time. And layering and adding on really carefully. I tried to show a couple examples of how to do that in the context of when we're addressing play, um, but also in the context of addressing communication skills. Let's not forget about those non-verbal -ver communication behaviors that are so critical and fundamental to communication. So I love Fred Rogers. You know, he he really he knew he knew it all for forever, basically. Um, so play is often talked about as if it were a relief from serious learning, but for children, play is, of course, serious learning. Play is the work of childhood. I love that quote, and I think it's real, highly relevant to autism early intervention. And so just, you know, we want you to know, um, of course, you all who are parents and, of course, you all professionals, I hope know this too, that obviously autism is just a part of who the individual is. First and foremost, they're a child, and first and foremost, they're a person. Um, and so I appreciate you all, uh, your time tonight. Um, I want to pass the baton over to Kim Tazard in just a moment, um, just to talk about a few of our amazing resources that we have at the Autism Society. And then we want to open it up to questions. I sure do hope you have some. I want to show you this last slide. This is not an exhaustive list. These are some of the references and resources that I have directly pulled from in, in this presentation. 
but this has some great um, for those of y'all who like to dig in and kind of look at the research um, or th those of you who want some practical resources on early intervention strategies I would say for those of you all who are parents or professionals looking for practical early intervention strategies that one of the best tools I've come across is um, the fourth one down here an early start for your child with autism it's a really practical guide to promoting social motivation and communication and other skills other skill areas in your young child with autism um, and and it's it's drawing from the uh, the body of research on early start denver model um, which is a very 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 promising and evidence-based um, uh, comprehensive developmental and behavioral intervention for young children with autism. And a lot of the work that we do at the Autism Society in Early Intervention draws from that body of research. So I encourage you to look at that as well. And thank you all again. Um, Kim Tazard, our, our Director of Family Support, take it, take it away. <laughs> thank you so much, Louise. And oh my gosh, if I had a Bic lighter, I'm aging myself, I would be lighting it and holding it up to you. Um, my son is now 24 years old and I wish I had heard somebody um, like you talk the way you just did back um, a good 20 years ago. So I um, want to just let you all know that we do have autism resource specialists and they actually serve all 100 counties and they're there to help you. So even if um, some of you are still in the very early stages and your child may not have a diagnosis yet, but you may be suspecting that it could be autism, um, they're there to support and help you and help connect you to resources. And it's the same for the professionals in the area um, to remember that they're there and you can easily find who the resource specialist is, um, we have a map that says gain um, help uh, and you can locate somebody um, that would serve your region on there. And I'm also going to have, um, there's a last slide on here for a connection specialist. And if it's easier just to reach out to her um, and you'll see that in just a minute. So you want to move to the next slide, please, Louise. We have, I think, one of the most robust websites um, around and I would highly recommend that all of you that have joined us tonight just take some time to bounce around our website and I'd give yourself a good 20 minutes because I know you're going to get just happily lost in there with all the amazing information that you're going to find. Um, there are just so many different resources and I do want to point out the toolkits. There were a couple things that came to mind for me tonight for you all. Um, we have a toolkit that's called Autism and Health. And I know when we showed kind of the red flags and Louise said to please talk to your medical practitioner. Um, I know I tried talking to my medical practitioner and I was pushed off. Oh, he's just a boy. He'll eventually talk. Um, this toolkit's designed so that you can go in and just feel more empowered and say, no, that, that's, that's not what I need to hear right now. There, I actually do have some concerns and um, it kind of gives you some of those tools in that toolkit. There's also a toolkit for accessing services and even knowing how to figure out what is available um, through some state funded services and through what's called your managed care organization. And again, these are all things that the resource specialist can um, walk you through. And also there is an IEP toolkit that I wanted to point out. Um, there's a number of other resources on there. Uh, Louise and her team have created just such a nice library of social narratives that are downloadable and easy to use um, with your loved one. And it kind of gives you an idea of, of where to start. So want to recommend that you look at those as well as some of the different blogs. Um, we have a really nice staying safe section and some um, nice resources on there as well. And there's also a statewide resource directory um, that may be, you know, helpful as well. Louise, you want to go to the next? Yeah, I was just going to say, I was going to chime in really fast. Um, you know, we've got a huge, a growing webinar library that the clinical department and our autism resource specialists have developed. Um, 
I also want to tell you guys that there there is a um, a uh, several early intervention strategies webinars recorded on our website including a number of webinars recorded in Spanish. So if you've got Spanish speaking families, uh, one of my colleagues did a really nice job on a, on a kind of the, a, a, a companion to what I just presented tonight. She provided that in Spanish and it's recorded. So I um, just wanna point that out as well. We also offer after the diagnosis workshops and we currently created a second one um, for your loved ones or if you're working with individuals who's um, who got the diagnosis a little bit later at eight, eight years old or over um, just really opening up to offering uh, just more virtual one-to-one -one. Uh, it's one thing that the pandemic has done if I can try to find some silver lining is I think that we're all a little bit more comfortable using technology so there are some options to get that information and Typically, um, these would be done in person, so we have had to move virtual for right now. Uh, but it's an opportunity to meet other parents um, in your region as well, who whose child you know recently received that. And it is such a great way to get connected, get connected to resources. Um, especially, the workshop usually goes for an hour and a half, and then when it's in person, actually um, two hours. And we cover a lot of ground, just understanding a bit more about what autism is, the very, very basic high level. Um, we'll recommend some of the other webinars and other resources that we have for some of the deeper dive that Louise and her team have created. In addition, we get into where to find help. And these are regionally done, so it's, um, really geared toward knowing what's available in your region. Um, so it's important that we're connecting you to the after the diagnosis workshop that is specific to your region. So you're getting that um, specialized information. Uh, and then just kind of where to start. All of this is so overwhelming and there's so many questions. And what, what about, do I need to worry about what my child's eating? I can't get them to interact with me. I mean, the questions go on and on and on. And what it's designed to do is to help you figure out kind of your starting place. Um, and it gives you permission to just breathe, you know, just um, taking a minute and knowing that this is not gonna be um, a race, that this is gonna be a journey. And it takes time and taking it kind of one step at a time. So um, do recommend that if one of the times that are listed do not work for you, that you reach out to your resource specialist again so that we can schedule that time one-to-one. -one. Next slide. And this is our wonderful Nicole um, and our 1-800 number, which is our main number. Um, so do feel free to to call that number if it's easier. And this is wonderful to get connected to Louise's team. Uh, it's, it's a great way to get connected in, you know, with our services and then especially with the resource specialists um, and chapters. We have a wonderful uh, group of chapters and support groups that are across the state uh, and have nine very active Hispanic support groups as well, and they're trying to do a lot virtually in addition to that. Louise, I'm going to pass um, over to you in just a second. Um, do want to remind everybody that if you click the main banner on our website for the, where it says COVID, you will be absolutely astounded with how much information that we have on there and the amazing social narratives and webinars that we spoke about. Um, it's just really, really great information. So I want to recommend that you check that out as well. Thanks for all of you for tuning in tonight to get this additional information. Don't hesitate to let the Autism Society of North Carolina know how we can help you serve uh, your constituents, your stakeholders, and the greater community. And we encourage you to join us for a future webinar.